OBS 28.0 is just around the corner, and normally I wouldn't do a video on a project update. This though has to be an exception, because 28.0 is an absolutely massive update that is going to drastically change the way that I and many other people work with OBS, not just on Windows and Mac OS, but Linux gets in on the fun as well. The first major thing is what's happening with the UI. This is what's sort of requiring a lot of time and a lot of testing and making it take so long for 28 to actually come out. The UI is being completely rewritten in Qt6. No longer is it going to have a Qt5 interface. Now I say rewritten, but it's not like it's going to be a completely new user experience. It's basically a port of the Qt5 interface. But it does cause a pretty major problem. It raises up the minimum OS requirements. So as of 28.0, you need to be using Windows 10 or later, Mac OS 10.15 or later, or Linux, it's a lot harder to define. It needs to be something that supports Qt6. So on Ubuntu, it's 18.10 or later. Along with this, it also needs to be the 64-bit variant of the OS. Now, I don't believe Macs even have a 32-bit variant, but I know that Windows 10 does. And there are various Linux distros out there that do have 32-bit variants. This isn't really a major problem for that many people. I know there are still some gamers who use Windows 7 and Windows 8 because they refuse to ever move on, but that is such a tiny, tiny percentage. And if you're using Windows, please use one that's actually going to have updates. Along with this new interface, we also get a new default theme. This is called Yummy. I honestly think it looks really, really good. If you don't like it though, you can go back to one of the existing themes like the original dark theme or anything like that. This isn't replacing any of the existing themes, it's just another one that is available. But if you use Linux and you use Qt a lot, you probably have another theme to find anyway, so you probably will never see the default OBS themes in the first place. There is another problem. There are a lot of OBS plugins out there that heavily rely on some of the Qt5 components. Now, these components still exist in Qt6, they just work, you know, slightly differently. So if the plugin gets updated to use Qt6, then the plugin is gonna keep working like it should. The problem though, is there is a lot of plugins out there that were made, they work, and then pretty much got abandoned. So unless someone goes and forks them, or maybe that developer comes back, there is going to be a lot of plugins that just frankly no longer work. This isn't going to be the case for every single plugin. Some of them will basically just seamlessly work, but there will be some this completely breaks. So you could argue that's sort of questionably good depending on what you need for your workflow. Something that is universally good though is there is an OBS plugin called OBS WebSocket. This is the greatest plugin ever created for OBS because what this does is gives OBS a full feature rich RPC server so you can control OBS outside of OBS. And about eight months ago, it became an official part of the OBS project. It was getting funding and development and things like that. It was basically under the banner of OBS. But at the time, it wasn't being shipped with the project. As of 28.0, the OBS WebSocket plugin is going to be by default shipped with OBS available to every single user. But right now, you can actually go and use it with 27.2.4. The reason why I didn't is because it was still heavily in development and I expected something to break. But why would you want this plugin? What does it actually let you do? Well, right now, there are a couple of tools listed on the GitHub. One of those being Touch Portal, which basically lets you turn your phone into a macro pad, a controller, whatever you want to call it. And you can control OBS just by tapping buttons on your phone, just like you would do so by controlling it in the OBS interface or having shortcuts on your keyboard. Or you can use something like Twitch Chat or Twitch Chat, however you want to call it. This is a third-party Twitch Chat client. It lets you do moderation, all that fun stuff you might want to do on a Twitch Chat. But you can also integrate it with OBS and control OBS from the exact same interface. 
You could also make devices like the Stream Deck, which is basically a glorified keyboard that has a bunch of screens on it, actually function properly on Linux. So there's a set of third-party drivers and third-party configuration software, but there was no way to have it interact with OBS. With the WebSocket plugin, you can do that. I don't have a Stream Deck, but I think it's really cool. What I do have, though, is a Wayland compositor. And on Wayland, I've said this a thousand times before, you cannot get hotkeys working on OBS. So, ignore the hotkeys, bind stuff to the WebSocket in your window manager, and be done with it. And it's just going to work. At least until OBS, you know, fixes this problem, or there is a fix that is actually possible in Wayland, this is going to make it so OBS is actually usable for me. Now, the next feature I'm probably not going to use myself, but it's still really cool that it's finally supported. You're finally going to be able to do HDR capture, and you can technically use this on Linux. I'm not going to use this, one, because I don't have an HDR workflow, and two, you don't really have HDR, so you can't preview HDR on Linux, but you can capture from an HDR-supported device. I don't know how many of these are actually supported on Linux. I know the HD60S Plus is. Not sure about the others. So if you were using this on Linux, and for whatever reason you wanted to capture your camera in HDR, or like a PS5 or something, you could still go and do so. And when you're playing a game or watching HDR content, and you're trying to capture this in OBS, but not capture in HDR, instead capture in SDR, it is going to correctly tone map that HDR content back down to SDR, so it shouldn't look weird. And when you're capturing HDR content, if it's being saved locally, everything is all fine and dandy. When it comes to streaming, right now you can only stream to YouTube. I don't believe any other platforms support HDR streaming anyway, so when they do, then those are going to be supported. Those are the major changes, but there's a bunch of other smaller changes that I'm almost certainly going to be using as well. One of those being that on Linux, H.264 encoding is finally supported for V4L2 devices. So V4L2 is video for Linux 2, I think that's what it stands for. This is when you're capturing things like a capture card or a webcam, pretty much anything you capture over USB. H.264 encoding is great. I'm happy it's finally here. We're also going to have native integration for YouTube chat. So you can actually reply to YouTube chat messages directly from the interface rather than having to go and like embed a YouTube doc, which I'm still probably going to use because I do it with my restream chat instead. Also, automatic file splitting based on time or size. So let's say you're recording a 10 minute video and you set the split to be five minutes. So when you hit that five minute mark, it'll automatically stop the recording and restart the recording and have that split into two separate clips. This is so useful because if you're trying to record a two hour podcast, for example, you don't want to record the entire thing and then find out it corrupted somewhere along the way. If you have them be separate, this is so much better. Previously, I was doing this manually. Having this be automatic is such a godsend. There's also going to be some accessibility changes, so if you want to change the color of certain elements, you're going to be able to do so. I don't know the extent this is going to let you control, but I hope I can change the color of my start streaming button to a color that is not the same as every other button, because I've accidentally pressed that button a couple of times. I want to make it red. Any color that is not the same color. There is also going to be a handle to rotate sources. So rather than having to like flip sources by resizing them into themselves and then pulling them out the other side, you'll now be able to rotate them like any sensible application. There is also going to be better tooltips, as in actual tooltips and not just alt text. There are so many buttons that say things like add or remove or properties. What is it the properties for? What am I adding? What am I removing? I have no idea. Once you get used to OBS, it's easy enough to deal with. 
but there's kind of no excuse for tooltips being that bad. At least just say, add thing. That's all. It doesn't have to be like a big description. Just tell me what I'm adding. Also on Linux, it is swapping from GLX rendering to EGL rendering. And without doing an entire video explaining what these two are, just know that it should lead to better performance. Now this one's not related to Linux, but for any of the Apple Silicon users out there, there is now going to be a native Apple Silicon version. It's not a perfect solution, because if the plugin was compiled for x86, it's only going to work on x86, and you can't run the plugins in emulation and then use them in the native version. So, if you need the plugins, you need to keep emulating OBS. It's eventually going to be dealt with as more plugins get a Apple Silicon version, but for now it's not going to be great. Right now there is a beta available, and there are pre-compiled binaries for Windows and Mac OS, and there will at some point be a pre-compiled binary available on Flatpak and available as an Ubuntu PPA, but um, right now that doesn't exist. So if you want to test it on Linux, you need to go and download the source code and then compile it yourself. And doing that for OBS is a little bit of a pain. But if you would like to do so, or you just want to check out the changelog, which I highly recommend you go and read, because I've very much skimmed over the changes that are going to be made, this page will be linked in the description down below, along with the forum post as well. So let me know. Do you use OBS? Is this change going to massively affect you? Are you going to make use of the WebSocket? Do you not really care about it? Is the QT6 interface going to be a problem? Are you going to have to update your OS? I would love to know. So if you like this video, I'm going to go and like the video. If you really like the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, go check out my Patreon, Scribe Story, and Bearer Pay, linked in the description down below. I've got a podcast called Tech Over Tea. I've got a gaming channel called Brody Robson Plays. That's going to be it for me, and I'm out.